Imagine yourself as an Uber driver. It's your full-time job and you spend 40 hours a week driving people around. Some days are slow and there just aren't a lot of customers. You spend a lot of time just idling, waiting for a ping to go pick someone up. Other days are busy and a new ride pops up as soon as you drop off the last one. Here's the question. On which day should you work more? If you're smart, you'll work more on the busier day. Your productivity is higher when the demand for Uber rides is high. You produce more rides per hour and therefore earn more money per hour than you would if you weren't busy and spent a lot of time idling and earning no money at all. You'll be able to earn enough money to pay your bills faster if you work more when it's busy. And of course, that's exactly what Uber drivers do. They try to be on the road during peak business hours. But in this example lies an important observation because this behavior doesn't apply only to Uber drivers. All rational people should be trying to time their hours spent working with their peak productivity. Microeconomic theory tells us that people will try to maximize their utility subject to their budget constraint. One of the choices people face is the trade-off between labor and leisure. In this case, the budget constraint is time, and time is scarce. We have to choose how we use it. If we want to maximize our well-being, we will work when the benefits to our labor are high and choose leisure when the benefits to our labor are low. The benefit to our labor is our labor productivity, usually measured as output per hour. If conditions are right and we can get a lot of work done in a little bit of time, then that is the right time to do it. If conditions make working hard and you can't get much done even with a lot of time, then that's when you should take a break and enjoy some time off. That's what the Uber driver is doing and that is what everyone else should be doing too. Family owned restaurants are open on the weekends but closed on the slowest couple of weekdays. Companies ask employees to hold off on taking vacations until the big deadline has passed. Airlines run fewer flights at night because the demand is low. That's the microeconomic situation. But on the macroeconomic level, labor productivity isn't smooth. It fluctuates up and down. There are times when the economy overall is seeing rapid growth in labor productivity, times when that growth slows, and other times when labor productivity falls. These fluctuations could be big enough to drive the business cycle. Maybe, just maybe, recessions aren't the result of animal spirits or monetary shocks causing a shortfall in aggregate demand. Maybe they're just the rational response on the part of workers to time their labor supply with the conditions that yield the biggest return on their effort. The 1970s provided a clear example of how this might play out. In 1973, oil producing nations conspired to reduce the supply of oil and force its price to skyrocket. The sudden reduction in oil wreaked havoc on the economy. Oil is an important resource used for many different types of fuel, plastics, and other consumer products. As a result of the shock, gas stations were running out of gas and many other industries were struggling to maintain their levels of production. Unemployment spiked to 9%, the highest it had been since the Great Depression, and the economy just didn't seem to be working right. In 1979, the president even got on television and tried to give the nation a pep talk that ended up being very poorly received. But you'll notice that the fall in labor productivity predates the recession. The economy just wasn't great in the 1970s, and the reason had nothing to do with insufficient aggregate demand. It was due to a technological shock, a change in the productive capacity of the economy, which reduced the productivity of labor. Since the rewards to labor were depressed by these external conditions, people were wise to choose to work less and leisure more, meaning a drop in GDP. Indeed, people worked about one hour less per week on average in 1975 than they did in 1973.
These observations gave birth to a new school of thought called real business cycle theory. It makes sense that people would work less when the return to their labor is low, but the question was whether or not technological shocks, these economic setbacks that are out of people's control and reduce labor productivity or slow its growth, were enough to explain the size of the fluctuations in the business cycle. Is it even possible for a technological shock to be significant enough that a downturn as large and long as the Great Depression could even happen? The economists Ed Prescott and Finn Kidlin embarked on a research program to find out. Rather than use the macroeconomic models like aggregate supply and aggregate demand to understand the economy, they constructed a mathematical model which represented the entire economy as one person, a single representative consumer whose choices would correspond to the average for the whole economy. Using historical data, they were able to show that fluctuations in labor productivity were just about exactly enough to result in the ups and downs of the overall economy. In fact, the choices of their representative consumer fit the historical data almost perfectly. Many were stunned. It meant this whole problem of business cycles, the central focus of this half of the course, was not the result of some sort of inherent instability in our economic system or a flaw in markets. This whole time, we have been thinking of growth in the economy as something that follows a trend. That an event like the Great Depression represents a deviation from how the economy should have been, a downturn from our potential. But what Prescott and Kidlin were saying was that the trend is an illusion. What you see, the ups and downs, is the trend. Even though the Great Depression was bad, it still represented an economy functioning as well as it possibly could have been. And our frustration with it is a frustration with people choosing to reduce their labor supply in favor of some more leisure because that is what was generally best for them. Economists trying to end the recession are basically the guy pounding on the door of the store owner while they spend some quality time with their family, demanding they open the shop back up and work instead. In 1986, the economist Larry Summers said, if these theories are correct, they imply that the macroeconomics developed in the wake of the Keynesian revolution is well confined to the ash bin of history. But Summers and many other economists weren't buying it. The model couldn't make forecasts and therefore couldn't really be tested. It could only explain events after the fact and Prescott and Kidlin couldn't offer any other examples of supply shocks to explain any recessions other than the one in 1973. Summers said, the image of a big loose tent flamping in the wind comes to mind. Still, the pair, Prescott and Kidlin, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2004.